So welcome everybody. Um, I am Katie Nicol Baines. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network here at the University of Edinburgh. My pronouns are she, her. Um, and welcome to, to this evening's event uh, for in, in honor of International Women's Day, which is focusing on the role of women in HIV and LGBTQ plus activism. I must acknowledge the, the sponsorship and support we've had for this event, um, as well as the fantastic volunteers in the Staff Pride Network who make all of these events possible. Um, those of you who are involved in the network will know that we are entirely uh, led and managed by a team of fantastic volunteers who are all staff um, and some PhD students at the University of Edinburgh. And to, sometimes to make our events uh, possible, we have additional support from departments at the university. And this event would not have been possible without the, the support from Gender Ed, um, from IASH, Gender Edinburgh, uh, from the School of Biological Sciences and the School of Health in Social Science. So thank you to all of those departments and organizations for their support with this event. Um, this event itself was a bit of a passion project for me because I have long wanted to bring together a group of women who have been involved um, in activism around HIV and LGBTQ plus rights. Um, it was kind of triggered by conversations that I had over a period of time with, with other women um, in the queer community who have long felt that while there has been real necessary emphasis on how HIV has impacted gay men, often the voices of women have been lost um, and overlooked. Um, and so today, um, we, this, has, this has been the culmination of, of an opportunity um, to bring together some fantastic women um, to talk about their experiences and their involvement of this, this, this subject. Um, it was inspired, I've, I've mentioned some additional inspiration, I suppose it was more of a re, reinvigorating of the notion after watching the highly acclaimed TV show It's a Sin, um, which profiled a lot of people who experienced um, um, the, the, the challenges of, of HIV and AIDS in the late 80s and early 90s. But again, it seemed like the stories of women affected weren't necessarily included, or at least not touched upon as, as much as they possibly could have been. Um, I'm supported um, today with my co-host, Siobhan, who I will invite to introduce themselves. Hello. Yes, um, hi, um, I'm Siobhan. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. I am here as co-host partly because I ran an event last month on HIV and activism, specifically with a Scotland focus that um, didn't feature women, <laughs> which is... <laughs> problematic and this event wonderfully addresses that and also um, because in my other hat I am um, the co-chair of the Disabled Staff Network so I have an interest in HIV and AIDS from a disability standpoint as well. Thank you Siobhan and it's really great to have your support. I'm now going to turn to our panellists and I'll come to you one at a time and just ask you to introduce yourself, share your name and your pronouns and why you're joining us today. Don't give too much away because I have a lot of questions to follow up on different areas and you all bring such a wealth of experience and expertise to this subject. Um, but please share us sort of your primary motivation for being here. And I'm going to go just from left to right as it shows on my screen. Um, so I will start with Lisa. Hello, I'm Lisa Power. I'm she. Um, I'm a dyke who's been around for donkey's years. I was on switchboard at the start of the 80s when the first calls about uh, what became HIV were coming in. Um, the first name we gave it was GRID, Gay Related Immune Deficiency. I went on to work in HIV, worked for a long time for Terence Higgins Trust. I was also one of the founders of Stonewall in the UK. Uh, and most recently, I was a uh, technical advisor on historical points um, to It's a Sin. So that's a very quick run through. Uh, I like interfering in things, as you can see. Thank you for sharing that, Lisa. As a fellow uh, interferer in things, I can relate to that. Um, identity. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I will come to Juno next. I don't have a list anywhere near as long as that, that fabulous list. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, my name is Juno Roche. Uh, my pronouns now are they, them. Uh, I'm okay with kind of she, her, and despite the fact that I can go on a panel and people say, what's your pronoun? And I say, well, I'm kind of like, I like they, them now. And then they go and, and here she is. <laughs> 
Oh my God, why, why do I say that? Uh, I'm a writer and uh, I write about, uh, and I've also been positive since the very early 90s. So was diagnosed pre-medication, which was, um, yeah, I'm not going to say too much. So, and I write and I write about gender and bodies and relationships and class and HIV. And I'm currently writing a book about pandemics and class. So, yeah. Brilliant. Um, Winnie, you're next on my screen. Hi, uh, my name is Winnie Sanyu Saruma, and uh, I, my pronouns are she, her. And I am here to share the experience of, of, of black women living with HIV in the UK and possibly, um, you know, the impact of HIV on, on black communities in the UK generally. Um, I'm an international development consultant. I mainly focus on uh, uh, monitoring and um, assessing um, community-based projects, mainly in, in African countries, in about 15 African countries. But I'm based in London, and I also do a lot of work within the Black communities relating to uh, Black um, health inequalities. Thank you, Winnie. Mm -hmm. um, I will come to Katie next. Hi, I'm Katie Deverell. Another Katie. <laughs> um, and my pronouns are she, her. And I first got involved in uh, 1988 when I went to volunteer at the Terence Higgins Trust. Thought I would just do a couple of hours and ended up working five days that week and carried on working five days a week for about six months. Um, and then from there, I got my first research job, um, an HIV prevention related research. When and that just kind of snowballed. And then I spent the next almost 10 years doing lots of research and evaluation, particularly around community-based um, HIV prevention projects, a lot with um, gay and bisexual men. And I was the evaluation field worker for MESMAC, which was Men Who Have Sex With Men Action in the Community. Um, quite an important project at the time, based in four cities around the UK. Um, and I guess uh, I... Um, the other thing that I think I guess was just I just think is interesting in terms of I think it shows the kind of development from that 10 years that I was involved was I ended up um, instigating and chairing Building Bridges Conference um, in 1996 which involved 11 different organizations and we were really interested in trying to kind of build some bridges between researchers and um, practitioners and HIV prevention workers and I think it just shows how much the whole field had kind of mushroomed in that time so that's a bit about me. Thank you, Katie. Um, Kerry, I'll come to you next. Hi, I'm Kerry, Kerry Hutton. Um, and like Katie, I was, I worked in the field, well, I, I started off in the field kind of prompted by friends getting worried and me getting worried and, and then worked in the campaigning side of things, first at the National AIDS Trust as head of policy from um, 1988 to uh, mid 90s and then at Immunity Legal Centre which I was the director of, which was a legal center for people with HIV and AIDS specifically. Our largest caseload being uh, asylum and immigration actually in the end, but we can talk about that again. Um, and I did lots during that time, including um, uh, being the chair of the UK Forum on HIV and Human Rights. Um, and then I too got diagnosed just pre-medication. So it was all a bit wobbly um, and then left dramatically the field and went and worked in a completely other field <laughs> and I now work in um, the field of migration mainly so migrants asylum seekers and refugees uh, across Europe and do a lot of things do a lot of other things but uh, I've been obviously living with HIV since that time. Thank you and thank you for sharing that finally I will come to Val. Hello I'm Val Harvey my pronouns are she her I am now, and have been for quite a few years, a very happily retired person. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the 80s and all through the 90s, I was an HIV clinical nurse specialist, which meant I looked after people in their own homes rather than in a hospital setting. Um, during that time, I was also a volunteer counsellor for the Terence Higgins Trust. And lately in 2000, 2003, 
I worked at the London Lighthouse when it, it moved forward into being more into education than a hospice. But as I say, now I'm a, a happily retired person. <laughs> One thing I have done recently, um, I was on stage at the Young Vic Theatre in a musical production called Carnation for a Song, which was a group of LGBT over 50s describing our life experiences, um, which was a lot about HIV and about activism. And it was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, and thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to kick off with a question um, and start with Gino, um, because it, something you wrote about recently kind of drew some parallels with the inspiration of this event, which was basically bringing up the fact that It's a Sin seemed to be missing the impact of, the, of at the time of, of, of the AIDS crisis and, and, and of HIV on women. I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that and why it was important to you to talk about that. Uh, I, uh, one, I wasn't going to write anything and I wasn't, and that week I'd been asked to go on the radio a couple of times and been asked to write for different people and I turned all of it down. And I kept saying to people, I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to be that person anymore that says, hold on a minute, what about women? I didn't want to be that person anymore because I keep getting people shouting at me and actually I'm getting older and it's not a very nice place to be in, to feel like you're being shouted at. And, you know, and like, and I watched It's a Sin and I thought it was quite beautiful. And I was there at that time. I lost endless friends. Week in, week out, you'd lose people. But I'd also, the week of It's a Sin, started, I'm doing research for the book I'm doing, and, and also for a project that I've got that's coming up ahead. So I started to talk to other women who were long-term, uh, who had been diagnosed for a long term. And, and I'd spoken to a woman who had been, di who had been diagnosed in the mid-80s, who only found out that she'd been locked in a room because the uh, fire alarm had gone off in the hospital and she couldn't get out. And so... I knew that the experiences that women were having, they weren't as much, and, and by God, I, I, you know, at the start of the article I wrote for the, for the I, I think it was the I, you know, I said that, you know, it was a, it, it's a given that gay men suffered atrociously. They suffered atrociously because at the time, gay men were treated atrociously. So, <clears throat> but I just felt like having watched It's a Sin, I just felt like, you know, you didn't even need to give a woman a speaking part, a woman with HIV a speaking part. She could have been in a room. And as a writer, I just felt, you know what? Actually, you could have put a woman in bed and she could have just been dying of AIDS, but it would have meant so much to all those people that are now watching it that would say to me after that, see, it's just men. Why do you keep going on about women? Because it's just men. And the trouble is, it's like, why did I write the piece? I write the piece because the funding that comes for women is almost negligible. We still have to fight for tea money. <clears throat> you know, I remember a few years ago uh, trying to set up a support group for trans women living with HIV, and we couldn't even afford to get funding for taxes for this, for that kind of, for, for, to put a group on and to sustain a group. And that weekend, other people were being given huge amounts brilliantly from the Elton John Foundation. And I just thought, you know, it's, we're back to that same thing where. There is no money coming to women in any way, shape or form. And if, you know, visibility, my friend, Dr. Ronks, who's on television, says quite brilliantly that if you, if you don't see yourself, you can't be that thing. You can't become what you don't see. And it's true for women. You know, all that had to happen if a woman was in bed, but even in my mind, I just thought, you know, in, in, there could have been a woman in bed. The central female character could have walked past with a nurse and she could have said, I didn't know women got HIV and the nurse could have said, not many, but just one or two. That one in there has got kids at home. It just could have just been like a statement that would have put women at the start of the pandemic, which they were, not in great numbers, but they were there. So I think for me, that's why I just felt like I could have, I would have, 10 years ago, I would have gone, oh, you know, it's fine. Five years ago, maybe I would have gone, it's fine. But in 2021, I just felt like, or well, 2020, I can't remember when it came out now. I suppose it was 2021, wasn't it? Yeah. It's, um, I felt like it wasn't, it wasn't good enough. I could see as a writer how you could have put a woman in there. And 
in, in, you know, like I'm often on panels with brilliant women who cared for people who were diagnosed in the in those early days. But I'm, you know, I'm just now starting to be on panels with women who lived with HIV in those early days. And that's really important. It's really important to make that distinction because otherwise women don't get the kind of care that they need. And we kind of scurry around trying to form our own kind of care networks. So for me, that's why I wrote the piece, because I just felt like, no, you know, you could have put a woman in there. It would have been an easy do. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback on my end. Apologies. I was just going to say, I think given the exercise that I've undertaken to identify this group of women, you know, it took effort. I, I had a brilliant co an initial contact um, in a, a woman called Nettie who connected me with various ones of you and it sort of snowballed from there but the fact that that was possible for me it kind of puts it into even greater context that you know this was a writing a fictitious in theory based obviously based on real things but it was a a, a story and writing in these 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 real people could have been possible um, so yeah, it kind of lends further to that frustration. Um, I've I've just seen my my fantastic co-host is asking if we could bring Lisa in to comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Siobhan, did you have a particular question you wanted Lisa to address? Um, no, just sort of. I know that you were obviously involved with a lot of the historical accuracy. I'm not going to say that you were the one who had to bring women into it to sin. I'm not going to put you in that position, but. Um, how did you find um, being a consultant on historical accuracy on the show? And did you find it odd for you when you watched it to know, did you notice the lack of women? Um, well, the first thing is I, the sort of historical accuracy I was advising on was um, what month did this magazine come out? <laughs> yeah. And um, what did Switchboard look like? And stuff like that. So I was not a script consultant. No. I saw tiny bits of the script and was sworn to confidentiality on them in order to investigate stuff like um, did somebody get locked up in a hospital and was this possible and are we quoting the right bit of the right act um, so that's that's what my job was and I was also one of literally dozens and dozens of people um, that Russell spoke to in the writing of it um, I'm not here to defend what he did or didn't do, but I do know that he is very clear that he wrote it as his story of his experiences. Um, and I think the most important thing is that quite often in the past when we've done something about HIV, um, the rest of the media just goes, right, we've done it for the year. That's it. That's that's our AIDS quota for the year. And the brilliant thing that I think is happening with It's a Sin is it feels like it's kicked a door open instead. And we are having panels like this saying, where were the women? Um, people are starting to write and talk about it. And an awful lot of people I can see as a historian, which is my original training, which I seem to somehow circle back to in my pensionable years, um, we are starting to get more of that history down and on the page. And I'm very keen that women are not left out of the history because we so often are, including not just in, in HIV, but in the queer movements and all kinds of other places. The women get put at the back of the room and that's not happening anymore. So you've touched on activism and the very important role that um, women uh, had in the activism, of, particularly of the time um would you say or well the 80s was interesting I mean I came to London at the end of the 70s and I was terribly shocked because I arrived just as all the lesbians had walked out of all of the mixed lesbian and gay movement things in order to found lesbian only stuff um so all the lesbians had walked out of switchboard for example and I had no idea when I applied to join in 1979 that I was only the second lesbian back in uh, and the first lesbian back in said that she thought that feminism gave lesbians a bad name so I got on with some of the men rather better than I got on with her to be fair um so it was a weird time and through the 80s I was very involved always in mixed lesbian and gay stuff I absolutely believed in that I'd come from a small town in the north of England, Lancaster, where most things were mixed. 
Um, and I, I was very committed to working together with gay men because, you know, we both got queer bashed. And apart from the age of consent, the rest of the failures to protect us in employment and the law and family law and stuff like that applied to both sexes. So I, I was very happy when lesbians and gay men worked together. And one of the one of the better side effects of the awfulness that was AIDS in the 80s, and I'll call it AIDS because that's what we called it then, was that lesbians and gay men started to work together again better and starting from switchboard but in many other places as well lesbians and gay men um, and outside of the very rigid confines of the right on gay lesbian and gay movement bisexual people too we all worked together um, the the 80s was a terrible time for people drawing up lines and shouting at each other from behind them um, but HIV did bring quite a lot of people together out of sheer humanity. And I think that paved the way for some of the other activism where lesbians and gay men got together around Section 28. That, that's really fascinating. Thank you, Lisa. And I, I've been listening to the um, Switchboard um, podcast that's currently about, and I would just recommend it to anyone. There is a podcast where they're using the logbooks from switchboard to tell stories as a kind of oral history historical exercise looking into history of what switchboard was and what it did and it's really amazing so I just thought I'd derail us briefly to talk about that <laughs> they're called the long books yes that's I was going to say can you can you put that in the chat because that sounds fabulous oh. yeah Siobhan if you take a moment to just write the name of that into the chat for the panelists and attendees that'd be great and while you they're do that, I'm gonna, awards. They're, yeah. they're tremendous. I'm going to come to Winnie now because I'm in, really interested to get your perspective of, of of the time because I know that you you obviously bring a, a, a an additional layer to to the experience of of of, of AIDS and, and HIV. Ah uh, yes, um, and I I need to start with the with the um, sort of I don't know if I need to apologize or, or what, but um, I haven't seen it since then, and it's been, you know, on purpose because for me, it was a very difficult time, the 80s, uh, and being diagnosed at that time. Uh, I was diagnosed in 1988, and even though I wasn't living in the UK, I was living in North America, and it was a very lonely, isolating, you know, you name it. It was just tough. I literally left um, North America to go back to Uganda, uh, where I grew up um, in the early 90s to basically die because I didn't see a way forward. I just so thought, you know, HIV is a death sentence and that's me done. And I, I wanted to die in a place that I, you know, that I loved. Um, and that was Uganda. So I stayed in Uganda for a while and then I arrived in the UK. I stayed in Uganda for a while waiting for death and it didn't come and I got bored. So I came to the UK on a two week vacation and I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, even though I, you know, um, the UK is not where I grew up. Uh, fortunately for me, I was, you know, and, 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 and I put it in quotes, I was born in, in this country. And so I was able to access treatment then. However, you know, all of these, all those experiences, before I arrived in the UK, I'd never been to a support group. I'd never talked to many people about my HIV status. You know, I was on my own. When I arrived in the UK, the black communities were going, you know, um, through a very difficult time, a very, very difficult time. A lot of people were dying. Systems were not set up to support families uh, living with HIV in the UK. I joined people who, you know, fought for some of those services and, um, you know, and so I became, you know, part of the community fighting for those services and then, you know, worked with Lisa because, you know, um, we 
found ourselves in the black communities and gay communities, we had to work together uh, um, because mainly of the issues around prejudice, around, you know, uh, around discrimination, around funding, you know, we had to work together uh, to be able to support our communities. And I'll leave it there for now to give other people a chance to talk about it. No, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'm conscious that while I'm here to facilitate, I know that you all as panellists might have thoughts that pop into your head. So please feel free to just speak up if you do have something you want to say and I haven't prompted you. Um, um, attendees watching, you can also ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, we will see the question and go through them likely um, in about half an hour or so. But also if something we are talking about prompts you to, to say something uh, or think of a question, please feel free to share them in the q and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the Q&A. And um, mm -hmm. thank you uh, again. Um, I, um, at, at the event that I did, one of the we were looking at the different communities that were affected. And um, one of the things that came up time and time again was the fact that until it was seen to be affecting white heterosexuals specifically yeah, as a large absolutely. group yeah other, I mean, than that, other marginalized communities yeah i mean i think that's where you know as a, just as an example in relation to that <clears throat> you know there's a there's a stat that comes from the uh, from avert which says that the most at-risk group are black and brown trans women and they are 49 times more likely to contract HIV than any other group. I mean, it's an astonishing figure. Yet, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a legal report for an immigration case, and I looked at looking at funding and looking at different kinds of uh, parts of funding globally for different groups. And I could I could literally only find about one percent of the total kind of AIDS budget that I could pin down it was dedicated to working out why black and brown trans women were the most at risk, why they would, and why they were being diagnosed late, why they were, were, were very ill when they were diagnosed, and why they were still dying. You know, and it's, so in a sense, it's like, it's really easy to forget that there are still some groups for whom this is a kind of, a, 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 you know, a, a, a literal make or break thing. And society really just doesn't care. You know, society, they are, in Judah Butler's terms, you know, they are the people that are disposable. You know, that, that's not my words. You know, this is society sees certain groups as being as, as being, you know, excess in need. So, so I think it's really important, and I think that's a really important point that only when it kind of seemed to kind of ebb into white heterosexual households was there this kind of moment of moral panic that that quite frankly it could get anywhere. I mean, it's it, you know, it has some kind of resonances of COVID, slight resonances. I mean, I'm careful not to draw too many parallels. There was a difficulty though in, in activism because I mean, in those early, in those early years, of course, one of the, one of the messages was anybody can get it. And yeah. so you were trying to kind of effect that bridge and, and say to people actually, yes, it can affect you. Um, you know, Mrs. Bloggs and Surbiton, and actually thinking about it, some of the, the you know some of the strategies used by organisations to, to, for instance, wake up the um, it was to wake up the women's networks and try and get them concerned about their grandchildren and so on. Um, and we forget. I mean, what what I was really interested in what you had to say, Juno, about the absences within it's a sin. And, and also what you said as well, Winnie, because I too couldn't watch it. <laughs> um, but my experience was very different from yours indeed, but, I, but for different reasons, I found it very, I have now actually. Um, but, you know, you forget, so, so there were people who were infected literally and living through in that way, but then that absolutely exposing period of people coming out as having HIV, mm. which clearly there were a number of gay men who did that, but there was also, you know, the, the incredible women who set up Positively Women and stood there and said, I am a woman and I have HIV and what of it? Uh, there were the, the sex workers who did likewise. 
um, and Winnie and, you know, Black, the Black Liners crew. I mean, that, that, that was an incredible act of bravery, actually. And it's, it's, I think we can't kind of almost realise how brave that is, that was now, because when, I mean, it's, again, <laughs> talking to people who weren't there, people, it, it is very difficult to kind of remember exactly how, um, how much of a Conservative MP's dream the 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 HIV was because it kind of went gay men, drug users, sex, yeah. and people from Africa. You know, all yeah. the people that everybody loved to hate. There was a kind of turbocharging of that if you wanted it to be turbocharged. And so people who stood up and looked unfriendly power back in the eye and said, Well, I'm here, and no, it's not my fault, and I want to help other people, but don't you dare dehumanize me in this process were incredibly brave absolutely i think the stigma of the time is something i'm i i still remember the tombstone adverts and the no, fact that people had so many strong misconceptions that just spread so people thought that um, and it, it popped up in the TV show as well, that people thought that sharing a toothbrush or using yeah. the same toilet and all these things that oh, yeah. were just fundamentally yeah. not yeah. true. And it, was, it, would, yeah. it would make it really hard. To, so to, to to state, I have this illness that people think means yeah. that they need to like not touch you, go yeah. near you. But, but you still can't. Um, I mean, it still is a stigma. I mean, it would it would be... Mm. You know, and it wasn't just the thing is, is that I remember my family watching my toothbrush and I remember going to, to, to my family's house to, and my family loved me and loved me dearly. And they loved me then. But they watched the glass I drank out of at the, at the table to make sure that that would be put separately on the for, for the washing up. But, you know, it's still I mean, it's like, it's it, you know, the stigma is still there now. Like this is a tiny, really short anecdote, and I keep it really short. I'm in Spain. I've got stuck in Spain. I go between here and London all the time, and I'm running out of my HIV meds. And I contact people in England. I'm in a really privileged position to know people. I contact people, and they say to me, "We'll just go to your doctors." And, and I think the person that's helped me just to go to my doctors is someone that's never lived a day with HIV. Because I can't just go to my doctors. I can't, if I go to my doctors and say I'm HIV positive, I'm not just saying that. I'm saying a thousand narratives that will run through his mind in my small Spanish Catholic town. You know, it's like a thousand. But so people still, I don't, you're right, Kerry. I mean, no, I don't think people can imagine. I mean, I remember looking, being at home and there being a newspaper on the table, I think there's a mirror or the sun, and one of them that said, ship them off to an mm -hmm. island yeah. of me thinking, it's me. Should I have should I eat the cornflakes first or should I take the bowl with me? Because you know, it's like it's and that was the truth for, for many of us. We we lived with that every day. We would we would take a deep breath and think the world wants us to die. Yeah. I'm gonna get to work and hope they don't find out because they'll sack me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's... I wanted to pick up on this notion of misinformation and, and education and Katie maybe um, you could comment a bit on your experience in that area because I know you've been involved in both education about HIV prevention but also the sort of bridging these gaps between understanding getting people to to realize you know what this means and, and understand, understand the reality rather than the sort of the stigma. Yeah, well, it is just really interesting. It's bringing back lots of memories, just hearing everyone talk, and one of which was being in the post room at Terence Higgins Trust with all the leaflets. I don't know if you remember that, Lisa, but yeah. it just reminded me of the chalice leaflet, which I can remember when I first went to volunteer. I was really shocked to see this was one of the leaflets we were sending out about the communion cup. And, you know, and it, I think you're right bringing this back because I think that's the kind of stuff that people forget, just the amount of misinformation and panic and... And just the utter kind of, um, oh, I don't know, when I look back on it now, it's just so traumatising, really, thinking what everybody went through. It's just, it is hard to communicate because I think things have, have changed a lot, even though things need to change a lot more. Um, and I think the other thing that's striking me is, I mean, a lot of the, the HIV prevention related work that I did, I think where it was most successful was where it actually was engaging with people who were affected and 
really working in different communities very closely, finding, you know, what's the kind of language you want to even talk about, you know, which things can get talked about in what ways, you know, really very kind of detailed, nuanced kinds of conversations, because I think, you know, this is where the blanket message thing, I think, just doesn't really connect to people. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that's a helpful comment, but that's the thing that kind of really, um, and I think the other thing that that really is really difficult is real life is much messier than a lot of researchers or um, <laughs> theory would perhaps kind of like you to believe. So I think, you know, that's one of the things that I, I think struck me, particularly like working with um, the Black Mesmac Project in Leicester, and I work quite closely with them. And just some of the community, I mean, I guess some of the men they were working with who were married or, you know, just didn't have any kind of gay identity or some people who perhaps kind of thought, um, you know, they wanted to kind of work with it within their communities, but the gay community didn't feel very friendly to them at that time. So, there, you know, there was a whole kind of thing of, you know, if I'm out promoting these messages, what am I actually communicating to people and, and how safe are people going to be? And you know, I think it, it, I, I, maybe I'm just rambling now. <laughs> But that, yeah. that's the kind of thing that's on my mind. But you're absolutely right. I mean, when I first went to work at Terence Higgins Trust in the mid 90s, I was working, um, I was managing uh, people who were working on services for people living with HIV and people who were working on services for the African communities. Um, and it was the first time there'd been people working on services for the African communities at THT. Um, and the gay men's services were at the other end of the same room. It was a big open office. Um, and the gay men had loads of pictures of willies and all sorts of, you know, very explicit stuff up on their walls. Cool. Um, and then somebody in my team put up some uh, inspirational Bible quotes. And one of the gay men down the other end of the room took considerable exception to it. And I said, well, if you've got your willies, she, can, she hasn't complained about your willies. You leave her Bible quotes alone. You know, it was a real and and that was, you know, what Winnie is saying about um, gay men and African women learning to work together, learning to support each other. That was a real, you know, it was an interestingly rocky process, at mm. point, but it did happen. And people did start to really stick up for each other and understand quite a large cultural difference at times. I really agree with what you said before as well, Lisa, about, um, and you'll know why I agree with this, uh, about the, um, the, the, the fact that in a, in a way it kind of, the activism around HIV forced honest truth out into the open, which kind of also links to what you were saying, Katie, about it being messy. So I was thinking about this before, before this session because, you know, compared to Winnie or Juno, my own HIV activism really doesn't exist. I mean, my activism has been since really leaving the field and has been in in the form of telling the dentist. And there's a whole kind of line of stuff we could talk about there. But but what was absolutely the, the what was being said was we don't want these people to exist. It would be convenient if they went away. It'd be convenient if they died. These are people that society doesn't care about. These were all the subliminal messages. And so the act of standing up and going, I exist. I, I, I demand that I'm looked at was was one way of doing activism but there were other things as well and, and those were so for me personally my activism was linked to two things one was talking about my experience of having sex when I was young <laughs> young and very sexually active and um, and realizing that you know in spite of the fact that I had uh, all the information I still sometimes had unsafe sex. And, uh, you know, I say that now and it sounds, well, I don't know if it sounds shocking or not actually, but anyway, at the time, that was a kind of really shocking thing to say because it went against the orthodoxy of even what the field was saying. So the, the field was saying, learn what you need to do and then change behavior. And, and it didn't always work. And the other one was around bisexuality. So as you know, Lisa, that's why I was, um, kind of smiling but there was, there was a number of, of occasions when you know the reality I I, I mean I'm bisexual but I, I didn't have much interest in coming out as bisexual I just was um, and fine and happy and you know loved but one of the things that um, kind of made me do it or one of the reasons I wanted to come out to do it was because um, 
the reality of people's sexual behavior did not correspond to the stories that were being told about people's sexual behavior. And so what I wanted to say, you know, I had sex and sometimes I had sex with gay men um, and, and that sort of thing. And there was, a, I remember in particular, a, a conference, can you remember this, Lisa, at uh, the ICA, which my friend Eleanor organized, called Invisible Identities. And I agreed to do this drunk probably one night with Helena in the bar <laughs> and I said yeah you need somebody like me on who can talk about you know the fact that we all get kind of drunk and screw and stuff and she said that's a very good idea and I'm going to book you so, and I went and I was terrified I was absolutely terrified and I was terrified of you know the real proper gay people who'd come out and been battling in proper ways for kind of and I remember Lisa and Julian and various people came as almost my bodyguards because I knew that I was going to have uh, it was going to be a difficult conversation, and it was, at the time, a difficult conversation. You know, bisexuality, can't you make your mind up? Those messages came from within as well as outside the gay community. Well, as you'll remember, I nearly got chucked off switchboard for admitting I slept with a man. I do. <laughs> that was your information to share, Lisa. <laughs> Oh dear, the time. I, do, I do think that the act of just standing up though, because I remember the first time, so like for a long time, it felt like I was, I knew I wasn't by the way, so I'm not claiming any uniqueness here, but for a long time, I was one of the only, if, if not the only trans HIV positive woman that would stand up and, and talk and would write pieces in the national press and would, and then think the next day, oh God, what am I doing? It's like, it's, you know, it's like, this is really, because it's tough doing that, but actually the act of doing that is such an act of rebellion against everyone that says that you shouldn't speak. You know, and I, I would write about sex and I would write about my sex life and it would be like, shouldn't you be talking about safe sex or shouldn't you be talking about, and it's like, you know, it's like it's this notion that in some way, so I'd always say to people, listen, you know, I think I became positive because I fell in love. And I think that's how most people became positive mm -hmm. because in one way or another, they fell in love with an act of sex or with, with the idea of a person or with romance or with a night. You know, you fall in love. Not very few people ever, ever that I knew actively went out and took that kind of immediate risk. The risk was love. The risk is being human. The risk is being silly and infallible and you know and, and 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 fragile so I mean I think that that and that always kind of stops people because it stops the narrative which is that in some way especially for people that have been diagnosed for a long time especially a lot of the women I speak to who were diagnosed a long time ago say you know that people would say to them what was wrong with you you got a gay man's gay man's disease what were you doing that was so wrong that you ended up with a gay man's disease almost like they were kind of like defunct as women, you know, that they, 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 you know, it was like it was more of a kind of uh, a crime in people's eyes to get this disease that has already been othered. So you didn't need to get it. So, I mean, I think it's I think you can't underestimate speaking, standing up on a stage in the ICA, drunk or otherwise, <laughs> and kind of claiming that space, because that to me has always been the most powerful space. And I think that's all I've ever done. I've never done, I've never gone on a march. I'm rubbish around lots of people. Terrible with a banner, because I dance too much, so the banner always goes down, and people go, hold, hold the banner up. So I've, the only thing I've ever done is to talk and to write, and I think, and to be present. You know, that's how I've met wonderful people like Winnie. Lisa, I don't know if you, I first of all met you many, many years, so many years ago. It, it would have been way back in the 80s, and we both seemed to collide in the Gay Times office. and. I always remember thinking, I want that bob. <laughs> this one's had like a fabulous sharp bob. I want that bob, I thought. Anyway. I still have it now if it wasn't for lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> I want, I, it's really, really brilliant, the kind of themes that are coming out here. And I really wanted to pick up on this sort of healthcare experience element. And I was going to come to Val um, for comment on your experience of working in healthcare at the time. So being on that sort of, you know, we at the moment we hear a lot about frontline care workers and the risks that they're being put up put, or putting themselves into because of COVID. And I imagine there were narratives similar at the, at, at the time because of you being a care worker um, and 
you know, supporting people who were either diagnosed or living with HIV at the time. Yes, I mean, it was a very strange time to be living through and to be working through. All of a sudden, we had this brand new disease that nobody knew anything about. It affected young people. It was a killer. And you could catch it. The fear in the early days was terrible. People were terrified to admit that they had it. Um, you know, I go back like others to the, the tombstone and the iceberg adverts that did nothing for anybody. Um, people thought you caught it by touching somebody and not to mention toilet seats or teacups or anything like that. And working in people's homes, I couldn't get anybody else to go in. People, healthcare workers, um, home care workers or home helps as they were in those days, nobody wanted to go in because I think nobody understood enough about it. Um, I did a lot of work with our health promotion department trying to, to educate people, to educate healthcare workers. But actually, it was all right to go in. You, know, you couldn't just catch it like that. But gosh, it was hard work. It really was. There was something about this illness, and maybe COVID has brought it back again, the, the panic that was around this particular disease. I mean, there are other diseases you could catch much more easily, but there was something about this disease that set a panic in people. Mm -hmm. I used to go out sometimes on the health promotion bus, giving out condoms and leaflets and things. And some people literally crossed the road yeah. rather than come anywhere near us. We got a lot of verbal abuse, uh, but a lot of people did come to us. You know, they did come in. They did talk to us. We were able to give out things. But to get across in the early days, I think the fear and, and the stigma was, was, was terrible. It really was. Um, most of my patients were gay men, uh, but I, I did have women. Not a lot, but I did have women. Um, most of them were from sub-Saharan Africa at the time. And we had children as well, of course. We had whole families. Uh, which brought a whole a whole different aspect to the work considerably. Um, so I said there, there weren't many women, but some um, they were there. And I, Winnie, I, I love the work. Sorry. No, no, no. I'll come back to you. I just saw Winnie had her hand up, um, and yeah. I assume it relates to something you were saying. Hmm. No, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt Val, but I think you know you touched a lot about the panic around hmm. HIV. You know, I think there were whole layers of stuff going on. There was the taboo around, you know, sex and how people got it through sex. Because and it said something about people's lifestyle, didn't it? Exactly. Yes. You know, yeah. it was also, you know, um, sort of steeped in shame. You know, uh, yes. you either had the wrong sex or you were part of a wrong group of people or a marginalized group of people, or, you know, it was all sort of like the people that they don't like in, in society. And, yes. and I think with African communities, especially, you know, and black communities, you know, in general, there was the stigma coming from the communities themselves, which was so toxic. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and when you layer that up in the UK, with migration and mm -hmm. and race mm -hmm. it's all there isn't it mm -hmm. <laughs> it is it is it is so much to deal with and we now know especially with covid that literally um being part of uh you know the black asian minority communities uh and experiencing, you know, different uh, microaggressions constantly, the prejudice, discrimination, literally, physically makes mm -hmm. you sick. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and those are things that people didn't understand before. And now we know with this epidemic that there's so much more that communities and individuals have been talking about and not being listened to that yeah. we need to deal with 
with the same yeah. kind of urgency now. What, what what's really what I kind of find really funny though in, in in I always love being on a panel with you, Winnie. I always love listening to you. You know, I tell you that whenever we, we talk, but I'm I, I just you bring a certain kind of uh, just a, a kind of calm to something. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, but I think that in a way, Val, you kind of like I'm not saying you're underplaying it, but in a way, like I remember when I was first diagnosed. <clears throat> and back then, when I was first diagnosed, you used to have to go in and have your bloods done maybe twice a week. If not, I kind of think in the, in, in the early days, we would go in every day. For some reason, we would go and sit in. But often, there wouldn't be any nurses. There'd be no one that would take our blood because only a couple of the nurses would agree to take our blood. And, and yet I used to. And that's, yeah, and that's very different than COVID, yeah. which is very odd, really, because COVID is airborne. Yes. It's really difficult for anyone to catch HIV for me. I mean, it was, you know, yes. a, as you say, it's a really difficult thing to catch. Yet mm. there were, it was really difficult to get people to actually work on wards or to get hospital porters to push you in a bed. If they knew that you were, I remember going in for something completely unrelated and they literally refused. They left me in the, the entrance of the London hospital and they refused to, I had to walk myself almost to the, to the theatre room. You know, there was literally no one would have anything to do with me. So it's kind of like, I think that, you know, I, I know that the, the, the kind of debt of service that I owe to those people that, that nursed us and looked after us and the doctors and the support staff and the people at Body Positive, all of those things, without those people, we would never have got free because it was deeply traumatic. As yes. Winnie said, you know, it was it was a deeply lonely, traumatic time, and I'm sure that many of us ended up with some kind of ongoing sense of kind of PTSD from that time. You couldn't have not done that. I remember a, 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 a incredible one, which was in the early days. There was a uh, hundred nurses were asked whether or not if somebody with AIDS was in a swimming pool, they'd also get into the swimming pool, and ninety seven of them said no. This is what I was up against. Exactly. <laughs> So, so <laughs> and that leadership within the health oh, service which yes, was so yes. important, those allies in health. Val, I'm interested, this might seem like a really obvious question, but why <laughs> did you not, because so many of, of, of the healthcare community seem to be buying into the, for want of a better word, bullshit, um, yeah. but you didn't. What, what made you understand as somebody in healthcare? Yeah. Um, several things recent, really. I was a Royal College of Nursing Health and Safety rep. So I had had um, a day's training, a seminar on HIV quite, quite early, maybe, oh, I don't know, 1984, something like that, 85 even. And I remember saying to them, but if it's so difficult to catch, people don't need to be in hospital. They can be at home. Yes, they said. Ah. Well, I said, in that case, tell me about it. It, it, it all clicked in then. Also, uh, a friend of mine came back from New York with it in 1986 um, and died very soon afterwards. So I'd already had some experience, but I'd, I had studied it a lot. And I thought, really, what, you know, what, what is the to be so frightened about? Also, the very first patient I saw happened to be a nursing colleague of mine from the hospital. And that I think you know, brought to all its its own emotional issues. Mm -hmm. But I, I never understood why people were, were so panic stricken about it when the education was there if you looked for it. I think it, it brings up a lot of the points that I think a few other people, including Winnie, have made around the fact that people were using this as an excuse to vilify communities that are already being marginalized and, and denigrated. Um, yes. I've, there's, I have two other thoughts. I'm gonna let Siobhan come in um, with a question here as well. Um, just thinking, reflecting on what uh, Winnie, Gino and Kerry have said about the sort of trauma of being, of, 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 of the way you were treated for having it, have it having HIV. Um, I'm just thinking about um, in the context of, of, of Val's talk about the, the way that the healthcare system reacted. Um, is there, uh, because we all know now 
the interconnectedness of bodies and our ability to fight things. And I'm wondering if the horrendous treatment that people had within the healthcare system being locked in rooms and things like that, if we if you think that that is part of why so many people died so quickly, not just because it was a horrific virus ripping through people, but because they were just treated so poorly. I think I, I think, think it's sorry. Really um, I mean, it's a combination of things. You know, it was a combination of you know stigma, and that might have been you know external, but also internalized stigma. Um, uh, um, you know, before effective treatment in the mid '90s, people didn't see a way out. I didn't see a way out until I arrived in this country. Uh, in 1996, and it was actually the social support that led me to start treatment rather mm -hmm. than starting treatment and then, you know, get the social support. It was, the, it was seeing others living with HIV talk about being, you know, um, literally like what they used to call the Lazarus effect, mm -hmm. being on their deathbeds and then literally being able to walk again and do whatever that got me, <coughs> sorry, into um, into activism as I know it, you know. But it was a combination of things. I think as well, it's really important to, and, and unless you were there at that time, and that's not me claiming any uh, ground, but when you were diagnosed with, with as Lisa said, I was, I was diagnosed with AIDS because when you were diagnosed, you were normally ill. So you were diagnosed at that point of, and you were told you had full blown AIDS and you had this long term. They gave me a DS-1500 and said that I wouldn't live longer than a year. But at that point, no one else would treat you. Mm -hmm. My GP would, didn't want to see me. No dentist would go. Near, I have a big gap in the top of my teeth, but I could quite... I could have it filled, but I won't have it filled because it reminds me of the 10 years I couldn't get a dentist. And then when I could get a dentist, I remember going to a dentist and they put a big red on the, on the front of my notes. And they sat on the counter and I said to them in this really tiny sheepish voice, before I was like I am now, now I would have just literally torn the whole dentist surgery in half. But I said, please don't embarrass me. Please don't shame me like that. If you've got to put a big red cross on my notes, please don't put it on the where everyone else can see it. And that first appointment, I went into the dentist surgery. And this is after 10 years of not being able to get a single, that's why they used to have dentists in AIDS wards and hairdressers in AIDS wards and people to do your feet in AIDS wards because no one else would go near you. They wouldn't go near your body. It wasn't just that people didn't want to have sex with you. No one that needed to look after you to check if you had this coming or that coming, no one would do those things. And the first time I went in to have a dentist appointment, they literally covered every surface with cling film. I kid you not, not just some surfaces. I mean, every single thing had been wrapped. It reminded me of that scene in E.T. where they try and send E.T. home for like a sterilized corridor. And I remember just being mortified and wanting just to cry and wanting just to kind of, and not caring if my teeth fell out. You know, I had lots of friends that had their teeth taken because they did, didn't care. It was easier to go to the to go to the whatever unit it was, Broderick or wherever it was, and get your teeth taken out because no dentist would go near you. So, in a, some senses, it's like I don't think people ever gave up. I only ever saw really I saw very few people give up. I saw people get really tired of living with constant stigma and rejection, and then trying to get really intelligent people not to stigmatize you and saying to them, no, you don't need to, you don't need to move the glass or you can come out for dinner with me still. Friends that wouldn't, would no longer go out for coffee with me or would not do that stuff. So your life becomes smaller and smaller. So I, I think in a way, it's not that, I, you know, I just, I literally finished reading a while ago, Oscar Moore's PWA, the book. And, and I think it's a great lesson in how smaller life at that point became living with AIDS and dying with AIDS, dying of AIDS, 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 AIDS complications. You know, and his, the very last entry, he writes it, he's, he can barely see, he can barely move, he's got no one's coming to see him anymore, but he still thinks he's gonna write another column. 
he still thinks that next week he's going to write a piece in the Guardian. You know, so I didn't see people. I didn't think that people gave up, but you know, it was it, you were you, you were being battered from all sides. It wasn't like anyone was giving you an easy time. It wasn't like you could go out and get a, and get a day, <laughs> or you know, you couldn't. All of that stuff had kind of stopped. So we bounded together with trans people, with gay people, with the people of colour, with with lesbians, with a whole group of us that needed to come together. And I think that we have formed communities that, to this day, stay strong. So, that's really true. Pre-treatment, there there were a whole bunch of things. I mean, there was a lot of folk wisdom. There were a lot of home remedies and things like that. And some of them were quite mad. But one of the things that I can remember saying to people, um, which I actually think had a tiny spirit of truth in it, was that the people who survived had all changed their doctors at least three times because basically they were the fighters. And they didn't take any shit. And if their doctor did something stupid, they moved to another one. Or they even moved town. You know, all of the people who came from Ireland and Wales and Scotland down to London because yeah. the best treatment was there. And there were genuine differences in life expectancy, even pre-treatment, if you got into one of the really good clinics. I think that's really true because I also remember those really early days at THT, how much information sharing there was going on and people coming back from the states and big meetings upstairs and, and even talking about trying to change the randomized control trials and things like that that was going on do you remember all that i mean big kind of community activist meetings around that how can we do this differently how can we get word out that this looks like it's working and i don't know i think i think that's really important i, th I think something i remember learning um and this actually came out of my experience um with having a, a my, my dad has ME and the patient community of people who have ME and chronic fatigue syndrome are very very outspoken in it because the medical healthcare community have been very bad in supporting people with that condition um, and he was telling me how there are so many parallels in that with what was happening mm. in terms of understanding and and treatment around AIDS and and like Katie has has raised the, the the notion of randomized control time at trials at the time was almost reprehensible because so many people were dying um, there needed to be more more progressive work actually done and actually the real experts were the people in the patient community it wasn't the medical community in the same way um, as it is for so many other conditions um, I'm not sure Val if you had your hand up do you Yes, I was good. When people were talking about you know um, red dots on and nobody nobody doctors and people not wanting to see them, I worked a lot with local GPs and some of mine actually I have to say were really good. Some would have nothing to do with me, but I had quite a few that were really good. A lot of my patients chose to die at home, and wherever possible I made this happen. So I saw them right through to the end. But even funeral directors some would not come in or if they did they would come in in head to foot in these like white <clears throat> white forensic suits <sighs> i mean i was lucky i did find one local one who was really good and what they did any protective clothing they put in the bag with them so nothing came was visible they put took it all off before they left the house nothing was visible again but so many of them just wouldn't touch them. So all the way through, you get this. You know what? Uh, if, uh, sorry, Winnie, go on. Well, you go on, Carrie. <laughs> I don't know why. I just uh, had a sudden need to um, uh, remind ourselves of the kind of comeback against that level of uh, clean filmness and uh, ignoring and all that kind of stuff and, and how um, poking through that was often done with completely outrageous tactics and reclaiming language. So I'm just thinking, you know, one of the, obviously you had the kind of tactics that ACT UP was using here and in Paris and in the States and elsewhere. And uh, you also had the kind of reclaiming of all of those um, uh, prejudices as well in names like the Disease Pariah Society in San Francisco, and um, you, you know all of that, all of those names which one knew that the establishment was using. You just kind of reclaim them, and, and funerals was a place where that happened. Mm -hmm. I remember, so you know, funerals with people kind of shuffling around and being in diving suits in order to put people in 
could turn out mm. utterly fabulous, just refusing, refusing to literally the end to toe the line in terms of what people wanted to do in terms of a funeral. So, you know, I'm sure we all went to many, many funerals, which were somewhat unorthodox <laughs> during that time and, and reclaimed, really. It was almost like, you know, sod you all, we're going to do this in a different way. Um, and those kind of acts of rebellion and revolt were as important in some ways as the kind of big stuff that was happening at a political level, which was obviously happening as well. We yeah. used to keep a copy of Diseased Pariah News in, in our office at Terence Higgins Trust, which Jack had brought in just to just to see how people would cope with it. You know, we weren't really trying to do anything much, just to make people kind of stop and think. Um, you know, and I can always remember John Campbell wanting to do a Christmas card one year that said a virus is for life, not just for Christmas. <laughs> Exactly, it was that kind of thing. <laughs> um, I know, Winnie, I think you wanted to come in. Go ahead. Yes, I really w wanted to talk about the early treatment because I was offered treatment uh, two weeks after my diagnosis uh, in 1988 because I was living in North America. And, you know, and I started taking it as a tea because, you know, and I thought, you know, this is going to give me a little bit of time. But of course, the side effects were horrendous. They were horrendous. And as we know now, uh, some people didn't even survive it because mm -hmm. the doses that were being given, you know, were higher and, and all sorts of things. But for me personally, you know, you could only access that treatment if you had insur you know, insurance or could pay for it, yeah. you know, on your own. So it was really, really difficult. Um, by the time I left North America, I was on dual therapy, but the impact of the side effects, you know, I was ashy, you know, like black. I was real thin because I couldn't eat the stress you know I couldn't keep stuff down it was horrendous and you know and many people didn't survive that treatment even when they took it um, of course when I went to Uganda there was no treatment so I got opportunistic infections which could have killed me you know, but didn't, you know, for, for all sorts of reasons, you know, but they took a lot out of me. For like two years, I was fighting opportunistic infections. By the time I got to the UK, I had a CD4 count of one. I was literally about, if anything had, you know, if I had picked up any illness, I would have died, literally. But I think one of the interesting things for me at this time um, is how some of the HIV treatment is being used um, to, you know, for, you know, treatment for COVID patients, you know, and how these epidemics are interlinking in, in, in ways that we couldn't even have foreseen. So I just wanted to put a little bit of that in the conversation. I think, it's, I think well, I just, just a really brief, like I think that I remember at a certain point, like when I, like I was in that kind of CD4 range, I think that there were so many of us that literally would count CD4, we could use two hands to kind of count them on. And if we got close to two hands, then we think that we might live another month. Uh, but it was tiny things, those little opportunistic, which sounds silly though, but like at one point I had, I used to get thrush in my mouth that would go in my throat. That was awful, I couldn't eat. But also this, and this sounds really silly and I said to people and they just don't get it, but I started to get verrucas on the side of my feet. And verrucas are this thing, they're like, they're like a tiny viral thing and, and they wouldn't stop coming. And it was like, I, I described to people like on the side of my foot, it was like a favela of, of verrucas. It was like veruca on top of veruca on top of veruca until I couldn't wear shoes anymore. It was too painful. So I couldn't walk and I couldn't eat. 
I mean, it is amazing when you think that we're sat here now and we're talking and we're doing the work that we're doing. But somehow we kind of, we lived through all of that. But all of that kind of, it felt a bit like being a, like an assault on your body. I remember I would watch things about young men that would go up and over the, the trenches in the First World War and they'd be kind of peppered from all sides. And that's what it felt a bit like being back in those kind of early days. It felt like you were peppered from all sides. And you'd say to people, I have thrush in my mouth, I can't eat. And they'd go, oh, thrush isn't anything. You just go to the, go to the chemist and get you know, and it just would never go. And I don't know if anyone, I'm sure that people here have had it, but I mean, it's just the most painful thing. And that used to really do people in because they just couldn't eat. They couldn't drink, they could have a straw and liquid. So, but I mean, I do think it's amazing. I just love the fact that we're talking about these times that here we are, nigh on 30 years later, kind of. Yeah, and, and I think that brings in, you know, uh, something also that is now being discussed a lot around aging and HIV. And, you know, and one of the ways that it's framed, it's, it's as if, you know, aging is framed as if, oh, there are all of these other challenges when you're aging with HIV. And, and yes, of course, but aging is a natural progression yeah, in life. Absolutely. And w the way it should be framed is how resilient have yeah. you been? You know, you're getting to an age where you, you are being thought about as aging. Yeah. I mean, I was 27 when I was diagnosed and about to hit 60 years of age. I mean, yeah. how incredible. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, it's that doesn't get mentioned about the resilience of people, about the good news stuff, about how yeah. people have survived and how strong we are, you know, especially as women, you know, yeah. because there's all sorts of other stuff we're dealing with. Um, so, yeah, it's the resilience of people that needs to really be um, um, stressed here and how we've managed to live this long. And in I some kind of senses, I just really say this really because it's such a joy to just be in this group of, of women talking. But like, like in some, like I'm never, I'm not one for monuments. That's, I mean, I live literally in the middle of nowhere, so I don't really care if there's shops or money. But I do think actually, that if one group of people, many groups of people, have owned monuments, the suffragettes or whatever, but people that have lived long term with HIV, who lived through that stigma, who bore the brunt, no one's ever apologised to us for it. No one's ever said, I'm sorry for the way that I treated you as a, as a collective whole. I think that if there's ever a, a monument so that we can go and be proud of that resilience, I agree with you, Winnie, because people are always talking about aging with HIV. And I think, I say to my mum all the time, and I mean it, I say, mum, listen, especially at the moment, she's in England, you know, getting to a certain age, I'm here. And I say, mum, listen, if anything happens to me, don't you dare shed a tear. Don't you dare cry for a second. Don't spend any money on a funeral. Sell my house. Use the money. Because I'm really happy and I've lived a really good life. I thought I would live a year. And I went to, I remember I went to university and I started at university and they didn't want to take me on the course. And they said, we can't insure you. It was like a fine art course. What happens if you cut yourself open in the studio? So I used to take my little pack with me to, to university that had bandages and plasters and, you know, so. I could be my own kind of nursemaid but like I didn't imagine I used to think if I can get to the end of this term and not die I will be doing all right and I did philosophy and art, fine art and I loved philosophy and I would just learn stuff and think oh, I'm here maybe I'll do the second year you know and we're here what resilience I mean this is this has not happened because we in any way have no, I, I think as, as you said, Kerry, in some kind of way, we have every time we've gone into a doctor's or a dentist and said, no, hold on a minute. You're not, you know, and, and, and people think it's changed. About, about four years ago, I was uh, asked to write a piece about cosmetic surgery. And I don't really write that kind of stuff because I don't want to, I'm scared that actually I'd be completely fallible to it. And I'd go, yes, do, do take 10 years off. I'm scared of that. So it's not because I have any high end, by moral kind of ground on it, but uh, I, I said, yeah, I will write something. I'll write something about having a boob job. And um, and I con this was about three or four years ago, and I contacted about 15 private healthcare 
trusts or surgeons or uh, different places, clinics uh, in England and across Europe. And I was turned down by 13 of them. Turned down by 13 of them outright because they said, we can't insure you in here. And some of them would say, well, I can't really insure you because I'm just, I'm a, I, work, I work in this hospital and I'm a freelance consultant in this hospital and their insurance won't tally with mine. And, you know, so it's like, you know, we still, we still live with that every day. We still live with that stuff every day. It hasn't gone away. You know, it's got much better, but it's got much better because groups of people like the people you see here, people that live with HIV and people that have supported us from day one have carried on fighting. And I think we deserve a effing monument. I'm for you. Let's oh, campaign for oh, a effing monument. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the stigma is still there. I mean, literally yeah. today, I was contacted by S4C, which is the Welsh language television channel. They're desperate to speak to someone with HIV who speaks Welsh. The only one that they can find is living in Australia. Mm. And he doesn't mind talking about it from Australia. But nobody who lives in Wales and speaks Welsh is willing to come forward because of the level of stigma still in Wales. So... You know, we've I moved a long way forward, but not not everywhere and not for everything. No, and I, I, I live in Cumbria and I don't know anybody else with HIV in my area. And I've it's... told, I mean, I don't wander around with a placard. <laughs> 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 that would be really silly. But, um, you know, anybody who needs to know, like doctor and dentist and anybody who needs to know, really, partners, if any, ever that happens again, is told. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know anybody else. I I was um, thinking so at the at the event that I I did that had a different panel. One of the things that came up was Generation Zero, which I don't know if you know about. Which is HIV Scotland's current campaign, which is to have uh, because of uh, undetectable, untransmissible cases, you, is yeah. to get that to to get no new transmissions, no new cases, but also no stigma so people actually know what HIV and AIDS are and yeah and try and try and yeah. des destroy the stigma by 2030. Um, I mean um, I'd question I mean I would question the link of I mean I think the thing is about I think that the U equals U it, it's, it's, it, it's brilliant and neat and it makes sense but you know the first time I heard U equals U was in about I'm going to say 1998 I think was when a consultant first of all said to me you know if, you, if we get your viral load right down, chances are you won't pass it on. Mm. So this is not new stuff. And the thing is about, about, about contracting HIV or anything, you know, syphilis or anything is that, you know, we're messy individuals. We don't follow, we don't follow kind of plans. We just end up in situations and we go, you know, I love this person, I'm gonna take a chance, or I fancy this person, I'm gonna take a chance. So I think in some senses, I think the link to stigma, the stigma is about we have the marginalized groups have, uh, have been stigmatized through this, actually not the illness. The illness isn't the stigmatizing part. So I get it when people go, you know, if I stand up and go, I'm someone with HIV, it, you know, it doesn't, it's not, it's the marginalized groups. People still have an issue. Look at Kate and, uh, I mean, Megan and Harry. People still have an issue with race with trans people, with gay people, you know, we still have those people on television like Piers Morgan who will stop at nothing to attack every marginalised group. So the issue isn't with, you know, the stigma. We will get rid of the stigma of HIV when we stop stigmatising marginalised and attacking marginalised groups. And that's what we still have to work on. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't have had Trump. Trump came about because the system is broken. And that kind of man, that kind of toxicity, comes about because marginalized groups are always at risk. So in, a, in some senses, I think that the way that we deal with stigma is to not think that HIV is somehow inherently full of stigma. It's just that the groups, I think it was Kerry, you said it at the start, you know, it was the perfect thing for a conservative politician to go, you know, all the people that are dying are the people that we want to die. You know, that's what, that's what happens. So in some senses, we've got to still attack those things. We've got to come together much more. We've got to stop putting our faith in slogans. You equals you is brilliant, but it is not going to change the world. What's going to change the world is saying, you know, people fall in love and people, people have sex, and we all do it. We all have quick sex, me messy sex, romantic sex, 
sex with more than one person. Well, you know, whatever it is that we do, and quite frankly, no sex. I think I think it's really important to kind of like uh, to, to not put so much faith into slogans. If, if this last 30 years has taught me one thing, mm. it's that hard graft on the ground trying to create equality is what makes the difference. Someone like Val going into people's homes and saying, no, the rest of you should go into the homes is what makes a difference, not a slogan that says, you can't catch it. You, you know, he's like, you can catch it. You know, you can catch it. You can fall in love, you can take a chance. It can happen because it doesn't, no one sets out. No one goes out for a drink. I always say to people, it's like around the prep campaign. I always say, listen, it's still, you're inherently, it's inherently sexist because I keep telling you that you need to get prepped to young women where they're likely to have lots of sex. Where is that likely to happen? That's likely to happen when they go to Freshers Week at university. It's likely to happen when they go on their first holiday with their group of mates. Why aren't you connecting up with holiday companies and getting prep leaflets there? Why are you ignoring it? Why are you telling me that the only place you're going to put prep leaflets for women is in abortion clinics? Why are you still doing that? Why are you not doing it? I'm, you know, it's like it's that same thing. We have to the rolling out, the dismissing of the stigma is going to happen when we go, really, you know, it's like, let's go to get to the people that are going to get it. And let's also stick together and bound together and say to those awful right wingers who are still there very much in force. You know, you stop treating us so badly. You just stop it now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that was a bit of a ramp, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it's a great, great, great ramp. And, and we're going to have the effing no. monument. Let's all remember that one as well. <laughs> well, do you want to come in? And yeah. I'm going to take a yeah. question from our Q&A. Okay. I just wanted to say, looking back on those early days, how it brought us together. Mm, definitely. People, those of us wanted to work within the situation. A lot of people volunteered. A lot of people, they all came together. And it was that that gave us the strength and gave us the voice. And if we have that voice, it's power. And this is what, you know, we will never get rid of homophobia, we will never get rid of a lot of racism and a lot of stigmas. But at least if we join together, we have the unity and we have a voice and we have power with that voice. And that coalition was quite messy. Mm. You know, mm. it was a quite messy coalition, that one. We had people with haemophilia. We oh, had yes. uh, people from, from Africa as build. Uh, we had women that people couldn't quite work out. We had gay men. We had and who are these bloody bisexuals, trans people? I mean, it was a it, drug users for heaven's sake. You know, I mean, it was those those HIV AIDS conferences and the coalition building which went on at those was uh, quite explosive, but very powerful. Yes, yes. <laughs> Can I add one thing um, yes. around? We are only going to be able to to start, you know, um, you know, for the stigma to go away and all, if we have those uncomfortable conversations yeah. Yeah, yeah. with people yeah. in families, in social groups, with friends. If we can't have those uncomfortable, you know, conversations around HIV, around our sexual health, around race. We are going to be here in another 30 years talking about the same thing. Yes. Yeah. That, that leads into one of the questions that we got, uh, where someone was talking about uh, women stigmatization and intersectional groups into allies. And um, they were talking about how all these types of activism intersect, you know, HIV activism, LGBTQ plus activism, um, black activism all of these communities um has anyone got do you think do you think that coalition is how that intersection still works i think it's an unstable coalition but it's one that we all learn from mm -hmm. um in terms of queer stuff if you go back to the roots of modern um lgbt plus activism it's literally the black panthers and the women's liberation movement spawned the gay liberation movement, which shook up the homophile reform groups that existed at that time. 
Um, and the stuff that Winnie has just been saying about the importance of talking to people and, and others about talking to your family and stuff, that just coming out to people on the tube in the middle of the park was very Gay Liberation Front. And I know we have some Gay Liberation Front people in the audience here tonight, including Nettie, who helped you at the start of this process. Um, you know, all of these things come out of each other, but they also learn from each other. Um, and, and inevitably that can be sometimes painful. Mm. Um, I mean, we, you know, we, we did an amazing job of solidarity while frequently fighting each other like cat and dog. Mm. <laughs> and people have a tendency to only remember one or the other, but it's actually the, the potent combination of the two that works. Oh, going out dancing. <laughs> yeah, that happened quite a bit. I mean, all the kind of lying down in the streets, you know, it's kind of one week lying down in the streets for the rights of people to inject whatever they wanted to inject. And the next week it was lying down in the streets for the right of people to... Uh, I, I, think, I, think in a certain, I think in a certain extent, I think that there were, there were kind of natural alliances that happened. I know that for me, you know, like a lot of the stuff that we've said, you know, I stand... I was like the, the the textbook has done sex work, has done drugs, is trying, you know, all this stuff. But you know, that was because of the way that I was treated by society. Society made it very difficult for someone like me to get a job. So I had very I had very few choices. So it wasn't that, you know, there were there were people that were naturally thrown together. In the late 80s, I was when we we set up one of the first housing cooperative, short life housing cooperatives in East London. You know, and we set it up because there were people who were young and were queer and being thrown out of the home. You know, that's what used to happen was that people would be, they, they, they'd say to their friends, I'm gay or I'm a lesbian or I'm whatever it would be. And they would be thrown out. They'd be said, well, pack your bag and go then. You know, and that was a reality for an awful lot of people then. So there were these natural alliances that were made that were just brilliant, really. And I think it, it's something, I think we put... I'm not, this isn't a rant of mine, but maybe it is a rant of mine, so I can own it. I'm old enough to own it. But I think we put far too much faith in slogans and T-shirts and campaigns, and not in that kind of groundswell of supporting, the you know, joining together. And as Lisa said, you know, it wasn't always easy. It was often really difficult. I, in the early days of, uh, of my transness, would get lots of, you know, it would be really difficult to try and find the right place to fit in because a lot of people didn't really want me in the room, didn't really want me in the room, or want people like me in the room. But still we made alliances. And that tonight's a kind of testament to the alliances that we made and the strength of them. And I think that we've got to keep funding that stuff. You know, that's part of the sadness for me is that some of the funding has gone from that and has gone to research. I think as Katie said that, you know, sometimes real life is much messier than research. And data and data is brilliant. And data is everything in relation to trans stuff at the moment because there is none. But you know, it's like it's. Uh, I think that the alliances that we've made over these years have been messy but brilliant, and they're like family in, in many ways, uh, dysfunctional family. And the learning, as Lisa said, the learning has been so amazing uh, from each other, from different communities. You know. I mean, no one, life can't prepare you for what we've learned through um, on this HIV journey. You know, I would give, you know, the formal education up and just have the learning I've done on this HIV journey and that would be fine with me. But my worry though, is that we are going to lose some of this if it's not documented. And there are lots of books out there, but no books about women mm -hmm. um, who are living with HIV or who are serving um, the HIV communities or who are advocates. And I think it's important to think about documenting that because the stories are powerful and we can't lose those. Yeah. I think I think we we had a conversation just the other week, Winnie, about about this very thing. And I think that you know it's only like like I have a platform now, and I can probably suggest a book I want to write, and there's a chance a publisher might publish it. That wasn't the case ten years ago, or even five years ago. 
but because I remember saying to people, I really want to write a book about women in HIV. I know these really interesting women who have been diagnosed in kind of funny places in Holloway prison or, or you know, they, they, people have tried to take their babies away from them. And I want to capture their stories. And people would say, you know, women's pain doesn't sell. It doesn't sell. And that there's, you know, there's a, a truth in terms of commissioning <laughs> is that actually, I think, and a lot of people said to me, when I wrote the It's a Sin piece, a lot of people said to me, why don't you stop having a go at Russell? And I said, I'm not, I think it's brilliant. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you write your own thing? And it's like, do you know how difficult it is? It's taken me kind of 15 odd years of writing articles and writing pieces to be able to have a platform where I have some kind of sway in this world. Because before I didn't have, but for me to write a drama for television, you know, it's like it's, you know, I am actually, going to do that next but not a drama for television but write a book next to start to do that thing but I mean I think you're right Winnie unless we start to get this stuff down which is why I suppose I wrote the piece about it it was so important to try and tell the stories not just of, of me but of Val of Lisa to get this stuff down the kind of communities that we formed of trust and that still exist today you know like I want to talk to Val more I want to find out you know I want to I remember going in and nursing my friend because that no one would come in and nurse him. And I literally nursed him to the day before he died because no, he had terrible diarrhea because of AZT. And no yeah. one would come yeah. in and nurse him. And I think I, I think I wrote that, not in, maybe I wrote it in the It's a Sin piece. Yeah, I think I did. I put that in, you know, and it's like, it's so, I, you know, it's like the, 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 these stories are so kind of, which was, yeah, which is why I kind of wrote the piece because I felt like it was, we can't not have these said. It's not Russell's yeah. place. I know where was I saying it was Russell's place to tell the story. He wasn't, he was telling quite a brilliant story of his own. But I just thought you could, if you would have included a woman in a bed, then it would have given me a lynch or kind of fight to grab hold of to kind of say. But even Russell, it took him five years to get Absolutely. that position. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and he won't he won't trash anybody about it because he's very professional. But yeah. people were saying things to him like, "Can you make it less about the gay men and more about the mothers?" Oh God! Like you, you know, know um, such a brilliant writer. I mean, the writing was yeah. exquisite, and I, that's one of the things that one of the reasons why I didn't want to write the piece was because the write as a writer, the writing was exquisite, the pace was exquisite, and I really I kind of was so worried that people would see me as being this kind of like jumping up on stage at the ICA, half pissed. <laughs> but I think the, the lesson is, if you think it needs to be told, collect it. Mm, because yeah. When I wrote my book about the Gay Liberation Front, the oral, the oral history that I collected, it was 25 years ago that I wrote that, and it, it flopped over dead. Um, got one bad review from somebody who hated my guts in um, City Limits, and that was it. <laughs> Um, and yet it still survived and people are still demanding to read it now. And it's becoming a set text on queer studies courses. So, you know, collect those stories of what's been happening for women before those women. I mean, now they're going to keel over of old age, not not AIDS. But <laughs> collect I copy, just in case people don't know what the, what the title is. It's No Bath But Plenty of Bubbles. <laughs> Thundering good read. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, have have faith in it because it is a good story, and eventually people are starting to realise it. I mean, mm. that's what I mean about Russell opening the door. There's going to be an appetite for those stories, even if it isn't there now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone has actually asked if they, if if people would recommend any cultural representations of women's involvement that exist in AIDS mm. and HIV activism, fiction, films. No, in terms of in terms of books, I kind of looked when I when I want if you're going to suggest a book to a publisher or to my agent, actually, I have an agent who I suggest to, first of all, you kind of have to do your research and find out if there's any other book set. And literally globally, you can count on one hand the number of books that have been written about li women living with HIV. So there's hardly any representation of women, positive representation of women living with HIV. I think uh, uh, maybe there's some, been some documentaries, but I don't, I'm none that I'm really aware of. Certainly book-wise, virtually zero. Stuff that's on film is mostly the women as, woman as handmaiden kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, 
there, there's some pretty strong women in 120 beats per minute, but they're yeah. side, side characters. Uh, there are some very strong women's stories, particularly narrative of a nurse, which um, Val may know of from We Were Here, which is a very a collection of very early stories from San Francisco. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're few and far between. It's a real yeah. empty area. Yeah, I, I think for women telling, I think women living with HIV to be centred in those stories is... Mm. I mean, we will change it. We will change it. There are women here in this conversation tonight that I know are going to write stuff and they're going to change it. And I think that that will happen. And I think it's just as Lisa said, I think we're coming into a slightly different time. You know, there was I remember getting up on stage at a TUC conference, a TUC LGBT conference, and people stamping their feet for me to be quiet because they were saying, you're one trans person living with HIV, there's no one else like you here, get off the stage, stop taking, you know, literally don't take the space. And I refuse, I don't know anyone that's talked at a conference say you have a light system that comes on a traffic light system. And I refuse to get off the stage. And I said, unless you're gonna drag me off, I'm not getting off the stage because I'm gonna take space. Cause it's like, it, you know. And there's so you know, <laughs> about reclaiming land. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it is that thing. And I think that that is, I think it's beginning to happen. And I think that there will be, and that's not, I'm really not, I, you know, there are many brilliant women that have come before who have tried to make work or who have made work and, you know, and, and as Lisa said, it's been very difficult to get that work published or supported or made or shown in galleries uh, because the narrative was that men died of this and that young, beautiful, there was, there was a narrative was that, the narrative was that young, beautiful men died of this and there's a kind of historical, literary, cinematic kind of history there that goes back to the First World War. You know, it's like there's a trope that is, you know, you, yeah. you never yeah. see the, the, the boys that go up and over the, the, the trenches are never unattractive. There are always people that people look at and go, oh, my God, he's going to die and he's so beautiful. You know, there's that, that notion of what that we ascribe. So women, you know, never fell into that. So I think it's taken, I think that it's taken a lot of years and a lot of bravery on the behalf of women who set up Positively Women, who set up all the in, 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 innumerable other groups of support and women that worked in and around the field. Uh, because I do see it as a, a, as a collective thing. I don't, there's no distinction for me between the women that supported me and the women that are like me and live with HIV. I just think that the, the, it's just that we've never been given a platform, which is... And there are many that, amazing that, stories of positive women from other countries too, and I'm thinking... Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All across the continent of Africa, but also yeah. in Eastern Europe, yeah. where there's a tremendous number of women with HIV, very badly affected, very badly treated by the state, oh, and they yeah. are tough women, and I love yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As part of our so the staff pride network we also have a research focused volunteer who runs a research seminar series and one of the events late last year was in collaboration with experts based in mexico um, who support people living with hiv um, in that country as well and it was really interesting to have that dynamic of the impacts on women and children living in mexico and particularly with the the dimension of religion and the 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 stereotypes around women and how women get so sidelined in healthcare anyway, and then adding into the additional dimension of, of, of being diagnosed with HIV and the stigma that comes with that as a woman in that country, it was really important, I think, and, and I learned a lot from, from being exposed to that. But you're also right, like this is such a limited amount of information out there, and we need to create more opportunities like this. This feels like the start of a conversation that should have been happening a lot more and hopefully we'll be able to continue more of it. I'm conscious of the time just because we were billed to finish at half past seven. I don't necessarily want to cut us off if people are happy to continue talking, um, but I'm also obviously very conscious of your time and your, your lives. Um, so I just wanted to flag that um, a lot of what you've said have, has kind of covered the, the things that were raised in the Q&A anyway. Um, but I wanted to check in and see how everyone, all the panelists were doing and whether there was anything else you wanted to bring into the conversation at this stage. Um, I want to talk about, um, and maybe this is a big issue, but uh, the media in this country. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but the damage they did, you know, 
to HIV, the cause, and they added to the stigma. Especially if you're a migrant, you're black, you're, oh my God, you know, the articles they wrote, everybody was afraid, as if we weren't already afraid enough. Some of the papers, some of the stories, they were horrendous. They were horrendous. And it really made it difficult to have like uh, HIV prevention campaigns. It made it difficult to, for us to get the messages across to the communities that we were needed to work with. And guess what's still happening? <laughs> That's still problematic. It's funny Sorry. you bring that up, Winnie, because one of the things I had wanted to raise was that very specifically, there was a massive stigma for women which was created by the Sunday Times under Andrew Neil, who not only ran a campaign saying that HIV didn't cause AIDS and the treatments were all a plot, but on top of that, Ran a, ran a parallel campaign saying that only gay men really got AIDS and there weren't and heterosexuals wouldn't get it, so they didn't need to worry about it, which just completely invisibilized so many women who already had HIV and basically said, "Well, you must have been up to some really shady shit to have to have contracted HIV as a woman." Yeah. Um, and that was that was the most influential Sunday newspaper in the country, yeah. and. It basically, people died because of that campaign. Yeah, it's no, yeah, just yeah. it's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and that guy still has credibility in the mainstream yeah. media, and that drives me mad. Yeah. I, and I then, and then it went on with all the local press as well, didn't it? Where I, I'm, I'm thinking of lots of the HIV prevention workers that I, I worked with who, you know, got exposed in the in the local paper. Public health money being spent on pornography, you know, all that people yeah. being outed, Ooh. you know, all that kind of stuff. Just. And what just just on that point, Lisa, that you said, it's just I, I uh, talked to a woman a, a couple of weeks ago for a project, and she ha went to her doctor. She went back to her doctor repeatedly, back to her doctor. I think for a period of about two or three years, with this kind of cascading set of opportunistic infections. But at no point did he say, because. There had been things that had said no heterosexual is going to get it. So uh, a woman in her, I think she said she was in her late twenties, going to the doc, uh, you know, a, a heterosexual woman going to the doctors was not going to be told, was not going to be sent for an for an AIDS test, as it was then. It's not an HIV test. No, that wasn't going to happen. Every other possibility was going to be explored. But I mean, that's still. I mean, that speaks to kind of sexism within the kind of. I mean. You know, it speaks to a kind of sex and it still exists now in and around women's health care. But I mean, I think it's, uh, I think I agree with you, Winnie, the media in this country, boy, if Meghan and Harry can do anything, oh, is to try and somehow <laughs> destabilise the centre of the media in the country that really is insidious. Now, and I don't know Meghan, I don't know Harry, I'm a, not a monarchist, far from it. So this isn't about that. But it is about the fact that the, the media in this country really is like the, is like this weapon of choice for is absolutely people right. to just to get and it gets to us really quickly. They can they can attack us so quickly and make us vulnerable so quickly. Look at what's happened with trans women recently. Look at the numbers of trans transphobic attacks that have happened in and around toilets or near the, not not by trans women but on trans people, trans people trying to go about their daily lives being kind of like attacked or confronted because, you know, the media said that we're dangerous. Mm. Yeah, it's just this absurd thing. As no. are <laughs> the boat, 40 yeah. miles in a boat heading to the shores are, we're absolutely. under attack. Yeah, it's absolutely. Yeah. It's absolutely toxic, the media, yeah. in this, yeah. and particularly in this country and what's happened post Leveson, I, yeah. I do not know, but it hasn't worked, has no, it? Has, it hasn't worked, it certainly hasn't worked post Leveson. I don't, I don't see any great changes. I mean, I, and I think that the, the easy kind of picks, I think as Winnie said, right, you know, in terms of migration, you know, there are still, there are women, and we know this from the work I'm a trustee in the Sophia Forum, and we know this from the work we, that we do in the Sophia Forum, that there are migrant women that end up going into detention, holding whatever you want to call them you know they're really they're camps they're prisons they go into these detention centers and they their hiv meds are stopped 
because yeah. they go into a kind of no person's land when no one has legal responsibility for them. They're in flux between countries. So this country is no longer responsible, this country is. So they lose their right to med medication. Yes, I mean, completely dehumanized in the process. And you know, and then you can just see, you can see a headline in, in a newspaper saying, migrants in detention camps take half the NHS budget. Cause you know, that's, you know, that's what they, that's what they would say. That's because that's what they say about trans people, despite the fact that trans people are less than, I think 0.3% of the population. You'd imagine that we were storming the Bastille. We will be storming the Bastille, but not today. <laughs> that happens tomorrow. <laughs> I think it you may I think it was Kerry who talked about the dehumanization of it and that to me rings true with a lot of the kind of stories that have come out in the discussion around the fact that people aren't being treated like they're human mm -hmm. um they're not being subject to any level of equality or or, or fair treatment um or being identified as human beings and it yeah. seems like you know, these these alliances that were forged, the bridges that were built were between these groups that were being collectively dehumanized in so many different ways. Yeah, yeah um, and there's a kind of spectrum of dehumanizing. I mean, you know, you, you've clearly got the people in the Napier barracks, which have been set up uh, and, uh, you know, out, outside the existing system of immigration detention at the moment. They, they are absolutely, those people are being dehumanized. And basically there's a, they don't exist in drugs. I mean, these are people who, crowded into one room, 200 to a dorm, were blamed by Priti Patel for contracting coronavirus. I mean, you know, they, and and the, the message was, it doesn't matter, it's their fault. So that's yeah. really, you know, asylum seekers, migrants are really totally, but also, you know, other... other that was the message. Sorry? That was the message I heard over and over again as well. Oh, yeah. it's, it's their fault. It's, it's their, their fault. own fault. That, that yeah. is, it's literally being said, Violet, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah. just literally yeah. being said. It was then and it still is. But, yeah. um, and, and of course, the reason for it being included in this discussion is, is that it's history repeating itself. It's kind of like yeah. Yeah. we love to hate. And, it, you know, it's that same old thing. You know, they, they sent for the communists and I did not go because I was not a communist. Yeah. They sent for the Jews and I did not go because I was a Jew and then there was nobody left. <laughs> we have to all be on the side of all other struggles. with yeah. and, and at the moment, yeah. migrants are on that front line and how in this country. Um, and it's not going to get any easier anytime soon. In fact, it's going to get a good deal worse. Yeah. But But also other groups as well. And trans people are clearly one of those groups. Yep. I think this um, notion of it's their fault is really yep. crucial here because they it brought it on themselves. It, it yep. plays to narratives that, that that you know are historical around homophobia, and in, in it is it as if you make some sort of choice yeah. to be this yeah. identity that you live, and yeah. you know it sometimes it beggars belief. You see the kind of it's your fault narratives around starving children in the UK who need food during mm. the school holidays. Yeah. And the kind of rhetoric in the media is the same. It's blame the parents. It's their fault. Why do we need to pick up the bill kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you say, it's this collective blame. I mean, I think that's what Trump and people did so brilliantly. Oh, yeah. you know, and I use that term really guardedly. But what they did so brilliantly was to start to separate people out, to start to kind of pull people apart. Because I still think we're sitting here, but, you know, like, a million people, I think it's a million, I might be wrong, but a million people still die of AIDS every year. Was it a million people die because they can't get access to treatment? I mean, yet this treatment has become, you know, most of the drugs I take are now generic. So they're supposedly much cheaper. So this should be, this shouldn't be an issue. So mm -hmm. I always think when people are, to go back to the point of U equals U, which I completely wholeheartedly support again, I'm not knocking that but you know before we talk about you equals you and I can have you can have sex with me you know I want to think about those people that aren't getting medication no one should be dying of AIDS no one anywhere should be dying of AIDS because it's entirely treated we can't keep saying in the west it's an entirely true it's just like diabetes now if there are still a million people dying of it because they can't get access to treatment we have to work as a global whole that's the only way we're going to defeat the rise of kind of the popular right and that's a, a, a kind of almost an oxymoron, but they are popular, oddly. 
and the kind of the rise of fascism. The only way we're going to defeat that is to is to rebuild down and double down on our kind of our links and our and people are doing that. God, people are doing that online. The number of people that are being great trans allies is just really, especially over this last six months to a year, has been astonishing. I don't have to do anything anymore. Um, there are all of these great allies that just literally jump on people and, and, and sort them out. And that's, so we are doing it. We are getting there. Um, um, interesting. Yeah. It's actually quite good sport for me. Sport for you, it's life for you, but it's sport for me. <laughs> Winnie, did you want to come in? No, I just wanted to say that it's really important around access to treatment, um, you know, for everyone. Because um, I remember when we were advocating for treatment for asylum seekers uh, who have like active asylum applications because, um, you know, um, they you know, there was this whole thing, they shouldn't have access to treatment. And it was through the National AIDS Trust, uh, Kerry, that um, he used to be part of, that really laid that campaign and we were successful in, in doing that. But if they hadn't, you know, it was like they wanted them not to access treatment, but they don't live in a bubble, you know, and other people don't live in a bubble. If a certain group of people doesn't have access to treatment, then HIV transmission will, will continue, you know, within the communities in which they're living because there's no access, especially as we knew, you know, as you said, very, very early on um, that, the, that um, you know, being undetectable, you couldn't transmit HIV. And what, you know, as people living with HIV, we knew this a long time ago. But for the general public, there was a necessity to, to, you know, to build up evidence to present to people. Otherwise, they'll be thinking, oh, no, it's not true or whatever. So it's really, really important that people have access to treatment, that people live dignified lives, you know, uh, especially in this country where people can access, you know, um, um, help you know and and social you know uh, services you know in different ways on the national health service but the th real thing we really need to tackle is inequality you know inequality is is a huge issue because we here as you can see we are not victims all we want is you know our human rights mm. And I, thank you, Winnie. I think that's a really, probably a really powerful point to draw our conversation to a close. Um, and you've all shared such poignant stories this evening, and I, I cannot express how grateful I am to, to have been here to witness it. Um, I'm really grateful to everybody that's turned up and stayed later than we originally billed. Um, so thank you. And I hope... Um, We'll also be able to share the recording of this as some some evidence of these stories existing. Um, and hopefully in future, there will be more testimonies that we can learn from um, and perhaps ultimately a statue um, of, uh, or a monument. <laughs> <laughs> um, monument, actually. It's an effing monument. An effing yeah. monument. <laughs> <laughs> Crucial. If someone could define that and uh, design that, an effing monument. I'm yeah. sure Tracy Emin could. Thank you all so much. Um, can, I, can I leave people with one piece of really cheerful information before we close, which is that do. Morgan has resigned from Good Morning Britain. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sensational. I mean, I'm I'm in Spain. I don't have any, I don't have any television, but that's that's good news for me because literally, I get you get the feedback of him on Twitter. So uh -huh. how fabulous! <laughs> good. That is a great piece of news. Let's celebrate that. Yes. Okay. So a drink and to the effing monument. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And maybe one day we can all have drinks around the effing monument. Yes, yes. that's, that's even great. better. Yeah. <laughs> it's to resilience and solidarity. Yeah. Definitely. Yes, indeed. Lovely um, to meet all of you. Also, but <laughs> great to meet you. Yeah.
Thank you. Great to meet everyone. everyone. Take thank care. You. Be safe, I was everyone. Really yeah, there. Really to in touch in various it. ways. So thank you all. It's been fantastic. Um, and thank you to Siobhan for, for co-hosting. It was invaluable support as well. And thank you to my co-chair and our fantastic um, comms media volunteer, Jonathan and Robbie, for supporting behind the scenes as well. Um, it's been really appreciated. You're all amazing. Thank you. Thanks for creating the space. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.